number of plants would increase. You can produce plants at a very rapid rate in very high volumes, and you can do it year round. You don't have to do it based on the, the season. We can do it all the time, and the efficiency of production will be exactly the same. So that's what micropropagation in brief is. The second technology, oh, well, we're still on micropropagation. Uh, you may be wondering how this is done. So let me explain in a, in a sort of a simple way. The first photo that you see is a stem that has approximately 10 uh, buds. These buds have the potential to become a complete plant. As you see uh, in this picture on top, each single bud has actually produced a small shoot, which can be rooted and that you have a complete plant. By the way, this is hazelnut. Um, these um, activities happen uh, in the culture medium where you have macronutrients, micronutrients. It's just like your fertilizer, basically. The fertilizer that you normally put uh, in the household plants is a little bit more refined than that. It has been experimented with, but by and large, these are the elements that plants needs to, to grow. And then we have to optimize growth environment, light, temperature, what kind of uh, medium it is, liquid versus solid. Those things are more empirical. We have to optimize, and that's where students get their degrees, MSCs and PhDs, and we have a technology in place. Cryopreservation, some of you may have heard. Um, this is a process in which we can freeze tissue at minus 196 degrees Celsius. When I was searching for cryo companies, I found several, and Cryonix is one of them. By the way, I'm not sponsored by Cryonix. I just found it funny. Uh, you can freeze human bodies. The photo in the middle is of a tank, which would have ideally four human bodies standing, facing each other, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and you can freeze uh, people for approximately $30,000 US. And the idea was someday, either by miracle of science or by some divine intervention, uh, people will come alive and then they will be walking and talking again. I just pulled up one Pat Williams, probably more familiar, but there have been at least 30 people who have been cryopreserved uh, in the United States. Uh, I hope that the technology is not becoming familiar with their politicians, so to speak. <laughs> plants are, <laughs> well, uh, plants are really, really kind compared to humans and, and animals. They can be cryopreserved and brought back to life. Uh, so far, it has not been possible with animals and humans. Uh, but plants are very, very kind. They let us do a uh, few wonderful things. So this is uh, a poor man's lab compared to Cryonix. This is our lab at Griff. So what you see is the main cryogenic storage tank. It has liquid nitrogen as vapors. And we keep those small tissues, small, small buds in liquid <sighs> nitrogen in that tank. It can have approximately 16,000 uh, species. If we put two together, we can have entire Canadian biodiversity in those tanks. It is an amazing technology from that perspective. However, the problem is we need to have technologies, A, to micropropagate, and B, the ability to freeze them uh, effectively. It's easy to put something in liquid nitrogen. The problem is how it will come back because tissue contains water. As soon as we put it in liquid nitrogen, water will freeze, it will form ice, and tissue will burst and plant will die. So what we do is we replace the water with chemicals that preserve the integrity of plant tissue. If they are in tank in that stage, they are in suspended animation. They will stay there forever. As and when you need, you can bring them back if we have the technology to revive, if you remember, I can make hundreds and thousands of plants with just one centimeter long stem. So those two technology in place, we can do wonders. All said and done, and it sounds easy, but it's not. Because most of the plants are like humans. They have moods, they have nature, they have aptitude, sometimes attitude. 
they do not let us play with them uh, as, as, as we want. So here is the, uh, the process uh, uh, for you. If you start from the top here, this is a culture. Culture means the micropropagation vessel. It has plants growing in it. We can isolate a tip. This is just a growing tip, isolated tip here as uh, in the photo. And then we process it through liquid nitrogen. And then finally it ends up in the tank. Once we want to get it out, while you carefully uh, remove it from the tank and then process it for culturing again. So this is back here again, and we can make a complete plant and then many, many plants from it. So technically that's what the process is. Another very interesting point about this technology is that it allows to clean viruses. There are many, many plants that are infected with viruses and somehow freezing them in liquid nitrogen kills the infected cells. So the tissue that remains is actually virus free. So we use this technology to create disease free plants. So this is the framework that I told you what we do in CPR. Now I'm gonna give you examples of which kind of plants we are working with today. So you have species for restoration and species for horticulture industry. You may ask why we do that. The Institute is for saving endangered species where this horticultural industry point of view comes from? Well, the answer is, in my experience working for about 20 years in conservation, I find it's a topic which is full of passion. We can have hours of discussion, but when it comes down to putting the money for research, that isn't there. Sometimes, even the wisdom is not there in terms of politics or our visionaries that run the country. For example, every single country that have visited that falls in so-called underdeveloped nations, they all have a cryobank, national cryobank. In Canada, we don't. The first cryobank that we have at the University of Guelph was donated by the Gosling Foundation. We have it. And I'm working and I'm trying to, I have a begging bowl about six, seven months of a year so that I can support my research one way or the other. Uh, that's the reason horticulture industry, because those projects give us some latitude. I make sure that we will work for the industry, but certain percentage of that money goes for conservation research. So it's kind of a requirement for us to proceed. So let me show you the story of GRIP, how this came into existence. People say nightmare on Elm Street. Well, Freddie is responsible. In my opinion, I think the real uh, nightmare for uh, Elms was really the fungus of Estoma almi. This fungus killed 97% of American elm. American elm is one of the most beautiful trees. It used to line up almost nearly all of the streets in North America. It is still one of the desired plants, but as I said, only few of them are surviving as a result of, uh, of this fungus, which is carried by, by the beetle. Now, Philip Gosling and Susan Gosling, as I said, they are bird watchers. Oriole, the bird, actually make nests on American elm. And as Philip tells me, you can fix your watch by the time Oriole arrives exactly the same minute and same second. He and his wife were so passionate that they were emotionally devastated when their elms in their backyard died, all of them. And for the 15 years or 20 years or so, he was struggling what we can do about this. He sponsored projects here and there, and then he learned that we do cloning. And he said, he came to my office and said, can you do that? Or why didn't you do it? He's very assertive, he's a man of action. He said, why didn't you do it so far? There's a tree on campus. And I said, we need money, do this. And he said, how much? I said, well, approximately $300,000 because it's a project, we need to have a postdoctoral. And I gave whole details, nine yards. He takes checkbook out of his pocket, here it is and my name on it. 
So I said, I wish I could cash it, but that's not how it works. <laughs> so let's go to the University of Guelph and set up a project. And that's what we did. So this is the photo of American elms that were planted 100 years ago on the University of Guelph campus. 70 of them, the 69 died, only one survived, which is what in the colored photo. That is the only elm on this tree that actually survived. It told us two things. A, this is not an escape because the fungus was there and it killed the rest of the population. And number two, because it survived, so it might have some resistance. So it makes sense for us to use this tree for cloning purposes. But we struggled for six months and there was absolutely no progress. We, cannot, we could not even get a clean cultures because our tissue has to grow on sugar. So if it's not properly clean, it will invite bacteria and fungi and tissue will be killed in, in, in a week or so. But we have Dr. Shukla with us, he, he has magic. He touches a plant and starts to grow. He had to struggle for six months, but the day he figured out how to crack this problem, well, this is what happened. See the first photo is the tree. We took a small bud out of it. And photo number three gives you a culture which is clean and it has multiple shoots. We can grow it then in the greenhouse. And those in the bottom photos that you see are the trees that we planted last year in Philip's greenhouse or his backyard. 25 of them, right? All 25 are surviving. And now, as of this morning, I was talking to Susan Gosling and she told me they are much, much bigger after this because this is last year's photo. Um, so we are we're quite pleased with it. We have given these trees to at least four different cities just to test if they're going to survive or not. Our problem is not their survival because of environment and other things, it's just a herbivory. The animal seems to love young plants and uh, they just eat top of it. So we have to find a way to protect, but the technology is in place. Uh, it's very important for, for many other birds as well. Oriole and uh, American elm is one story, but there are a number of other uh, birds that are becoming extinct because they don't have a nesting place. Uh, this is one example here, um, uh, the Acadian flycatcher. Uh, loss of habitat, loss of nesting, loss of food. So we are also working on a couple of plant species that are food for the birds. Um, the birds require a very specific food because they migrate, they have to take really long flights and they cannot refuel like our airplanes. So they need complex carbohydrates and proteins that will make them fly over long distances. So it's very, very important. Now, we started looking at the other examples or other trees. So there's another one, American chestnut, very difficult to propagate and conserve, but here is the uh, technology for the same thing. They all look the same, but again, as I said, each plant is different. So all of this work is done by one master's or PhD student. The photos look very similar, but trust me, the students really have to work hard to get one bud to a complete plant, cryopreserve it, and then bring it back to, uh, to uh, full life again. Another example, cherry birch, what you see on that map and the yellow dot is the forest where uh, cherry birch used to be. Hundreds and thousands of plants. And today we got only 14 left in Ontario. Uh, I think that's in the entire Canada. There might be others on people's private property, so that are not accounted for. It's basically Ministry of uh, Ontario's data. We developed the same process for uh, conservation of, of cherry birch as well. Now, at this point, uh, we wanted to test if we can go back to a real ecologically important species. And that's when we started to work with Parks Canada. And we were very, very fortunate that they were kind to, to let us uh, play with one species, which is called Hills Thistle. So as you see in those Petri dishes, uh, we made the technology work so that the small tissue can actually grow into shoots. 
This is an endangered species, very critical for ecosystem because it's food for pollinators. And some of the pollinators are endangered themselves. So it's kind of a double whammy in, in that sense. So we decided to clone it. As you saw, it was quite successful. And then we planted it uh, in, in different sites. Um, we chose uh, about uh, 12 different sites. So my entire lab went to Tobermory, Ontario, and we planted more than 400 plants or so. And those sites were quite variable. Some of them were just stony. There was nothing in terms of nutrition, but we were very surprised to see that the plants that we uh, propagated and cryopreserved survived much better. And we now believe that because they have been such a difficult situation to survive, liquid nitrogen is minus 196 degrees Celsius. If they have survived that much stress, well, they can probably handle this one. So it's kind of an added bonus with these plants that they are more stress resilient. And a number of my students are now working in further refining the technology so that we can uh, produce more resilient plants uh, that will not require uh, much care. If you think about this, there's no water supply there. So they have to rely on natural water and uh, the nutrients that are there. Initially, yes, we can provide them with good soil and, and water, but after that, they have to be on their own. And for us, it was the case. Um, so Hills Thistle was one of the first success. It has been published in uh, journals that are uh, internationally recognized. So it's not a small story. Actually, it was quoted by then uh, Minister of Environment as well as one of their success uh, uh, project. And something I should mention, the last photo is of a flowering plant. This plant does not flower at all. Sometimes you can see 10% or so flowering, um, but that will take five years after germination. So let me put this story backward a little bit. We were given 29 seeds, only two germinated. And from those two, we make thousands of plants. We did all of that experiment and we got huge percentage of flowering plants in the first year. So that was something that we did not expect. But again, as I said, they become conditioned and they are now quite happy that they have been rescued. So it is working for us that these types of plants actually survive better and flower in first year as opposed to five or six years. So these, this was an example. I have another five or 10 examples, which, but again, the photos will look same. So I'll just stop for the uh, restoration part here, but we have planted uh, Mingan's thistle in Quebec National Park. And now we are working with other national parks. They have given us a list, no money yet, a list of plants that needs to be saved. So uh, we, are, we are currently working and hopefully uh, there will be many, many more uh, coming to um, uh, to overlap for, for rescue purposes. So let me give you some example of horticulture industry. Uh, how does that work and how this technology is applicable uh, to, um, to these species? The reason is, of course, they are industrially important plants, but they are still plants, they are still biodiversity, and they are food crops. And we need to work on crop species that are meant for food security. This is a requirement. If we want to save Canadian food system with environmentally friendly farming systems, we have to have our own varieties. It's not a good idea to import foods all the time from uh, other places because the fuel cost is environmental carbon footprint and all of those things associated with importation. So what are we doing with IPPS uh, in terms of commercial applications? We're working with fruit crops. We are working with nut crops, ornamental species, uh, any species that industry in Canada, particularly in Ontario, is interested to propagate and sell. And that's where we come in because this kind of technology is not or was not available in, in Canada until uh, we started working at the commercial scale. So right now we work with a commercial company uh, located in Windsor and they have the capacity to produce millions of plants. 
and their their facility was established uh, with uh, with collaboration from uh, from Grip. So here is the example of uh, hazelnut. And why hazelnut? Well, there is chocolate and there is Nutella. I actually, <laughs> and they all go very well with wine. So the next crop we started working was actually grapes. Uh, uh, so here is uh, hazelnut. Uh, if it was up to Ferraro, they'll spread Nutella on the globe. 80% uh, of the hazelnut actually is consumed by Ferraro, believe it or not. And many of us are not familiar with the fact that Ferraro's plant in Brentford produces all of the Nutella, all of those uh, Ferraro Rocher chocolates for North America and Australia. All of this is done right here. They have a thousand employees set up uh, for making those, uh, that stuff. The problem is they want hazelnut growing in Ontario not importing all the time from Turkey or other places. So that's where we come in. Can we propagate? So here is an example, the same thing using our propagation technology. We have plants and they are growing in Simcoe Research Station. Uh, I hope that this technology will grow uh, into uh, other commercial setups as well. Ferraro is very, very fussy about what they put in their chocolate. So their hazelnut has to be a very specific shape and there's a reason for it. It has to go on belts, it's all automated system. Uh, it's amazingly uh, difficult to, to reach that quality, but it's, it's possible and we are growing those types of plants as well. Another commercial crop is apple. And uh, apple, as you know, is a grafted plant. You have to have rootstocks and on top of that, you plant the variety that you want. That's why sometimes you see on one tree, there are five, six different types of apples. This is all grafting technology. So we are working with Upper Canada growers uh, for, we have already transferred this technology to them. So they are now able to grow very successfully, hundreds and thousands, as many as they want. And those plants are very uniform and they are much more vigorous. They complete growth in much faster uh, fashion than uh, the conventional, uh, conventionally grown plants for, for that matter. Similarly, uh, we're working on ornamentals. Uh, these are some of the examples shown here. And one thing you would notice in the uh, photo um, here, some of the plants actually flower when they are in boxes, uh, which basically confirms the idea that this technology induces flowering much earlier. You saw that with Hills Thistle, rather than five years, it was just one year. In this case, Dr. Shugla can make them flower at will sometimes. So we are, we are working, <laughs> uh, we are working. Uh, his wife is, by the way, quite happy because he often uses this. Uh, and these last longer. Now, if you put roses in a vase, like maybe a week, 10 days, 15 days, this is three months we are talking about. Okay, so another interesting point with ornamental was working with the indigenous community. This was a, a really great accomplishment for our lab. For several years, we were trying to work and, and suggest to them respectfully that uh, the technology can be used. But within the framework of indigenous community, they have their own rules and regulations um, that we have to follow. For example, anything that leaves their premises cannot come back because then spiritually it's not appropriate to be accepted back. However, uh, they were very, very kind. They gave this as an experiment and as a test for us, can we really propagate their plants? So six of them were given to us and we gave them uh, 3000 plants back, which they distributed on Mother's Day in their community. So we are that's a separate project someday I can give you more details how we, we did that, but here I was just want to make a point that the project has taken us to places where we did not really expect that we will be able to go and, as I always say, somebody upstairs is kind. Alright. Uh, another interesting area that we are focusing on is medicinal plants. IPPS for medicinal plants. The reason is simple. 
90% of the wild plants used in traditional medicine are threatened with extinction today. And I think that's a great resource that must be saved because even today, we don't have any cure for Alzheimer's, depression, cancer, diabetes. At best, we can manage them, but there's no cure. So there may be plants out there that have been traditionally used to either prevent or even cure. And I have personally seen dramatic results in different countries that are working with medicinal plants. Even today, 80% of world's population actually uses herbal medicine as their primary source of uh, uh, treatment. I'll give you only one example here, uh, dealing with brain malfunctions and some of those plants. I'm sure you're familiar with, with these kinds of data. Depression is a global crisis. Uh, it really leads to uh, a lot of things in terms of mood swings, loss of interest, aggressiveness, suicidal thoughts. All of those factors have been associated with, with depression. And unfortunately, out of every 12 persons, about seven suffer from one or the other type of depression, according to WHO. Uh, in 2019, more than 4 million Canadians were actually diagnosed with some sort of mood disorder. Dementia is an advanced stage, uh, probably related to depression as well. Uh, half of uh, half a million Canadians have dementia today, including Alzheimer's. This number will nearly double by 2030. And you'll be surprised, healthcare system has to incur significant costs. 10.4 billion in 2019 just for management. Yeah, there's no cure here. If we want to bring a medicine to market, the cost of this is. $360 million. So it is an area that we normally don't think about how much it is uh, causing uh, and costing our healthcare system in Canada and other places as well. As a result of that, the market for herbal medicinal plants is rising. In fact, is one of the best investment in stock market today. It never gives you less than seven, eight percent. Um, I'm told by a, a, a friend who actually plays in stocks all the time, he says, ah, this, this business is, uh, um, is very good. Uh, you work and I get advantage. I said, yeah, that's the way life is. Uh, so COVID-19 told us a lot of things, and one of which was depression, loneliness sometimes, and really, really uh, challenging situations, uh, tested relationships and, and whatnot. We are all familiar with that. Therefore, I'm not surprised when I see that uh, mind and mood, stress and sleep, as well as immunity is now at the top of the list of people for what they care for. And um, personalized medication uh, has become a priority and people are taking charge of their own health. And that's where plants like these come into place. Um, I'm more interested in working with plants that treat mental disorders. And I'll tell you why in this short time, it's not possible to talk about everything, but um, for 25 years, we have been working on two molecules, melatonin and serotonin. These are the neurotransmitters. They are produced in your brain and mine around four o'clock in the morning. As we age, the levels of these go down. That's why there are sleep disorders. And people believe that if there's a cure for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or anything else related to brain malfunction, it will come from sources that are rich in these neurotransmitters. We feel happy when there is modulation of serotonin levels in our brain. So we were looking at plants that have been used in traditional medical systems like traditional Chinese medicine and Indian Ayurvedic systems. And the question we were asking is if melatonin and serotonin are present or not. It has been 25 years and we have analyzed many, many different plants and have selected few that have naturally high levels of melatonin and serotonin. Holy basil from India is one of them. So we have now isolated one line, which is particularly rich in melatonin. And 
um, the plants are available. So that's why we are trying to develop this technology so that everyone will have access to, uh, to these simple plants. Uh, there are many others. I'm not going to discuss uh, many of these, but ashwagandha seems to be uh, a very promising candidate. I was just browsing through the data of ashwagandha use. It's again from Indian Ayurvedic system. It is the top selling herbal medicine for 2021 and 2022. Uh, why, uh, why this is important? Again, I'm trying to package uh, all relevant areas to, to medicinal plants. There's a very interesting relationship. I thought I'll leave you with, with this thought, like how important plants are in our life. This is a comparison of meditation compared to drugs. Now, let's look at the drugs first. All kinds of drugs, whether they are originating from plants or they are synthetic molecules, including from cannabis to cocaine and any type of drug. When they affect human brain, they affect it through melatonin, serotonin, dopamine, and many other regulators. The problem there is that as we consume them either for pain, for depression, or any other medical issue, we get addicted. And that always leads to some dissatisfaction, other problems, and temporarily, yes, there's a relief from stress, but generally, uh, it is addiction and agony at the end of the day. Temporarily, they might give some relief. On the other hand, if you look at the process of meditation, and there's nothing to do with religion or here. Meditation is a simple process of brain concentration. It's scientifically evaluated process. It enriches our neurons, simply. There are many, many reports to, to suggest that. And meditation also improves the secretion of melatonin, serotonin, and dopamine. Now, can we put these two things together, combine with a herbal medicine, those kinds of con concentration exercises uh, for brains, will it help or not, is the question that we are currently asking. Why we do that? Well. Plants are in abundance, they are inexpensive. If you buy any drug out of the store, that's gonna be 20, 30, 50 times more expensive. And sometimes we don't have to even consume, just being in nature actually can uplift the mood. The plants do have that chemical language that they try to teach us. If we understand, that will be very helpful. So mind, meditation, and spirituality is all free. Doesn't cost anything but it works through the same mechanism as any drug would. Plant really connects us uh, with us. It's a journey inwards. It connects with others. It connects us with environment as well. So I'm a big supporter of being with nature because that is ultimate sp uh, spirituality uh, for us. As, um, as we all know, plants heal body, mind, and the spirit all the time. I'm taking this discussion somewhere else, but my idea is to support plants as best as we can. If we don't have them here, well, we lose a lot, except, well, it's just not the crops and horticulture uh, commodities and endangered species. In fact, human uh, population will also be affected significantly. Is there uh, a trend that's growing? Now, these are the plants that are not necessarily classified as medicinal plants. But this is another category as uh, food as medicine. And believe it or not, the market is huge for these products now. If you go to a herbal store, you can find 10 different population or 10 different formulations of uh, turmeric, for example, capsules, powder, tablets, even Starbucks is making turmeric latte and coffee. And in the United States, almost every <laughs> coffee shop will serve um, uh, ginger and uh, uh, turmeric latte and coffee. So people are waking up to the reality that simple food, which is inexpensive, can have long-term uh, health benefits. All right. So if I were to summarize here uh, the properties of IPPS or the integrated plant production system, it's a really good system for mass production. Uh, we can cryobank every single species found in Canada. 
It could be endangered, it could be food crops, nuts, ornamentals, medicinal plants, technology remains the same as long as we are able to refine, that will work. So what are the opportunities and why we really want to do this? Some of the reasons I've explained, but there's one reason that I want to highlight. For example, if there's a disaster somewhere and it's very likely to happen, Temperatures are rising, so plants that were used to grow at a certain elevation, now they are not able to grow there, which means that that population will be wiped out. But there'll be some other species or some other related plant that actually will, will grow in that environment. But at that time, we need hundreds and thousands of plants. I'm talking about forest here. So first of all, you need that genotype, that plant in your bank somewhere so that you can get it. And then you need the technology to multiply so that you can plant that species in its optimum environment. That is mix and match based on what environmental changes will do to our agricultural system. So from that perspective, it is very, very important that we have this technology in place so that we are able to deal with future calamities uh, more effectively. And genetic diversity can be easily maintained because, for example, we have many, many different types of thistles now. So it's not that we are planting only one, and if that gets infected, the whole thing will die. Sometimes people ask that question, giving examples of potato famine. But here, cloning is being used with intelligence. We have 20 different types, even in the seed biodiversity, sometimes you don't have that much diversity, what we can do and actually create and I'm not talking about GMOs, these are the cell-based modifications that are possible that can happen naturally and no GMO involved. What are the challenges? Well, 21% of uh, the plant species could be uh, threatened according to IUCN red list. In vitro technologies are not known for even 2% of these species. So there's a huge amount of work to be done and it has impacted a lot of things, including my retirement plans. I was supposed to retire two years ago, but the Gosling Foundation wouldn't let me go, and so will the University of Guelph, so it creates a problem for me. Um, and the simple reason is this area is very specialized, and only uh, very few labs in Canada actually can do that. I'm not even sure there are few. Currently, as far as we know, we are the only one, so uh, it's a bit of a challenge as well. Fundamental research is needed. Regulations need to be um, relaxed by the government so that we can get access to endangered species. It's a crime to isolate tissues from endangered species in nature. Uh, those things have to be more streamlined. We're working with Parts Canada, so we generally don't have a problem, but it took us five years to reach there. Uh, of course, funds, as I said, is a major issue. Uh, this is an area which really requires people um, to do their master's and PhD and postdoc for that matter. And it, it requires funds to do it, which is why uh, we always are writing grants for this. Another challenge that I have, which I alluded to before, is the education. A lot of people are not familiar with, uh, with plants I've done this exercise for over 20 years now in my first year course, second year or so third year course. Um, people recognize thousands of corporate logos, but not 10 plants. So I tell my students who have taken, they are agricultural students, they are coming to and become an eggy. So I ask them, do you know 10 plants? And it's a pin drop silence in the class. So go back. And fine, sometimes people have 50 plants in their homes, but they wouldn't know their names or what they're good for. Yeah, they look beautiful, that's it. Uh, we need to educate about the importance of, of plants uh, to, to people. And that's, that's extremely important. Uh, the reason uh, it is important, they are not just about plants. If you search different cultures across the globe, you will find that every culture talks about four or five elements listed here, sky, water, air, fire, and earth. I was looking at what is the organism on this planet that actually mediates all those five elements. So far, 
I have not been able to find anything but plants. They grow in soil, they take up water, they transpire water, they take up carbon dioxide, they give you oxygen for breathing. The only thing that's not visible is the fire. And that's the beauty of the system. Anything that we eat to get energy is actually fire. It's just not there just to see you visually, but the fire is energy. And plants, as we all know, give us food. That's the energy that we have. So in some sense, to me, that's a spiritual. So a few years ago, I decided to launch this magazine uh, called Spiritual Botany. It is available. It was supposed to be my retirement project, and it, it just got delayed. But still, there are nine issues out. As and when I have time, uh, we publish, and the authors are seven years old to 75 years old. Uh, it's available on the internet. Anybody who has experience with plants, um, for example, one time we asked the young students, what do you think about plant? And those stories are published in here. If there's a healthy drink or food you want to share, uh, we are all for it. So we look forward to, um, to those contributions. The idea is to give a platform to talk about plants and how they can uplift our, our, our life. So um, last slide here. Um, in my opinion, plants really are complete organism, and they give us a sense that it's not a good idea to look at things with just one perspective, because everything on this planet is connected. Uh, I'm not trying to define uh, divinity or God here. All that I'm saying is, to me, divinity is just like bracelets or a necklace that we have. Or, Look at the necklace, all you see is diamonds and pearls. The thread that really binds all of it is not visible. And that is the divinity. And somehow being in the vicinity of plants gets you closer to, to that concept, uh, in my opinion. So here are a list of people who, um, who work with us. And... Oh, oh. So that's the child telling us, let's say what we can while we can. That's uh, uh, the slogan that we have. And thank you very much for your time and patience. Thank you very much, Parker. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, vertical farming is the area that's being suggested um, to um, um, as one of the solutions for it. What you just said is is a, is a million dollar question. I wish uh, I had a definite answer for it. But the way I understand is, if we really sincerely want want to do it, it is actually possible because the productivity could be enhanced with closed environments quite effectively. The problem is going to be, this is what we can control, but the environment out there, we cannot. So are we going to stop the corporations from polluting the environment? That's a different question. Can we reduce the carbon footprint effectively enough so that the plants will survive? The plants are very forgiving. If we put them in adverse condition, they will survive, but we need to have a stabilized environment for some time. If it's totally fluctuating, 
then it's a problem. I'll give you a simple example. In May first week or second week, we plant. And sometimes it's three degrees in the morning and minus three in the night. Most of the plants die. Plants cannot take fluctuations. If we have floods, we have temperature changes like this, all of those things are not controlled, it will be challenging. And feeding those many people uh, is going to be very, very difficult extremely difficult. It's doable if, if we plan now. Canada has COP15 uh, meeting in or had it in December uh, last year. And now it's called 30-30-30. We need to protect 30% of land, 30% of water, and do this by 2030. Is it going to happen based on the cross performance? Not likely, but whatever is achieved is, is, is great. So two things, uh, A, we need to streamline how we think about agriculture crops. And two, we really need to educate people that if the tomatoes don't look similar, doesn't mean that they are bad. It's the consumer driven market here. Um, I just saw a film a couple of days ago, issue with tissue. One roll of tissue consumes how many trees? If we start teaching at grade two, problem will be much less. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you were talking about the, the the hill thistles, and you went to Tobomori to plant them. Is that where they're normally found? Exactly. Yes, that's where they are normally found uh, because of the pollinators are located in, in in that area as well, and they bind this type of soil that's needed there. That was the reason. One of very very good question. One of the problem with the endangered species is that we don't get to plant in an area where they became extinct. That's against the law, unless Parks Canada or some government authority is supervising it. So, which was good in this case, because we took the plant from there, we planted it back there. You're not gonna look at doing um, working with other groups to try and uh, plant other reintroduce plants that used to be here and yes we we are very open and i actively uh, ask people to suggest and uh, give us the plant material to work with uh, as i said american elm we have distributed quite a few places now the plans are that we will have one american elm tree planted in each school in certain areas and have a um, information sheet available so that children in young grades can learn the importance of uh, trees and technologies and why we should worry about them. So continuing with the hills thistle, uh, you said that many plants have uh, flowered very quickly. So did anybody collect seeds? Are those seeds um, viable? Very good question. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, I'll give you an example, which is, we've studied a little bit more. Yes, we collected the seeds, and those seeds are uh, relatively more viable and produce plants. Sometimes, uh, for example, in Mingan thistle, which is a very related plant, uh, it grows in Quebec National Park. It used to be in nine different islands, now restricted to only three, because plants are dying. It only flowers five to nine years, uh, in five to nine years, and then dies. Even if it produces seeds, those seeds do not germinate. We did everything possible, different types of soil, even in cultured conditions, nothing germinated. But guess what? When we removed the outer coating, the embryo was isolated 100%. So in nature, that would be one problem because plant is so scared and threatened that it develops the type of seed where the embryo will be protected. This is what called, uh, I normally say plants are at least as intelligent as we are. The family or mother will protect the child under all sorts of circumstances, so nothing should protect. This is how nature has evolved. Think of the child in womb. Embryo in plant exactly the same, totally covered. So that is the strategy plants really adopt. So if we take off that seed coat, 100% germination. And we have now seeds from those plants. They are in the cryobank as well. 
That's good. I think it's the eventual goal should be to produce viable seeds so that you know you don't have to go back to cryogenic and then come back and because of the expense and the work and um, yes you're right uh, uh, unfortunately there are a lot of plants that do not set seed so they are vegetatively propagated and they have to be processed this way um, could you uh, expand on what happens to the uh, American elm with with the uh, the fungus yes. and and um, okay will those new trees be infected again do, do you maybe that's a little bit outside of yes uh, the infection uh, in American elm happens it's a three-way interaction the beetle brings the fungus to American elm even one spore is more than enough to infect the tree it basically goes into the uh, uh, xylem tissue and basically blocks those channels that take water up and food comes down uh, from from the leaves when those channels are blocked you can see the plants becoming pale and over the period of time it simply dies so that that's the process generally it was told when we looked into the literature that 25 years is the age when trees get more susceptible uh, for getting this disease. For me, there's no way of knowing whether these disease uh, resistant, so far disease resistant trees will actually be resistant or not. Um, because we are forgetting that the fungus changes or mutates very, very frequently. The trees take a whole lot of time to uh, to mutate or, or develop any kind of resistance. There's nothing like a resistant tree. It's basically relatively tolerant. That's all is to it. At some point, they may become so. And again, for the infection, uh, to give you an example, we estimated uh, what is the time frame for the trees to be infected, and we found that if the tree somehow senses that the infection is coming or has come within the first 144 hours then it can produce hormones to deflect the fungus and will not be affected this experiment i didn't talk about it because it's more different angle to disease resistance we actually drill the hole and put the microspore or the spores of fungus into the trunk of the tree and then looked at the what happens in the tree over a period of time and that's how we determined 142 right 144 hours um, that's the window and this is all based on chemical signals there are hormones produced in the tree that will um, that will deter the fungus to enter the plant tissue if somehow we can achieve it the trees will be resistant and can be made resistance. So that's another area that we are pursuing at this time. Thank you. You're, you're saying you know why that one tree survived? That's why? You know that one tree that survived? Yes. That's why it survived? We, we think that's what uh, it would be because it does, uh, it have sensory uh, signals that, that it perceives. Yes, uh, there is a problem. And plants do sense. This technology is not something that we imagine. There have been um, uh, examples where uh, people have clearly shown that you cut one plant and then it sends, in terms of the volatile compounds, messages to the rest of the population and they start producing those defense hormones. So that's, that's quite likely. Yes. Did you collect samples from other kind of American elms in Ontario that survived or just that one tree? Uh, we have from others, and not only from Ontario, but other provinces as well. Yeah. So the whole idea is that if we were to recreate uh, uh, Elm Street, that it should not have only one elm. It should have different kind of elms so that there's no nightmare. There's a very prominent old American elm near Fort Elm, uh, out in the middle of the field. I don't know if you know that one or not. We, we probably do, we have a map of what uh, is available. One of the problem that we have is, we have a system, if somebody tells us there's American elm, uh, our problem is how are we gonna go up and collect butts because most of the butts from the top are the best one to work with. So we have to uh, appoint an arborist so that we can, 
somebody can climb and do. But if that's possible, somehow, if it's manageable, we have a system that people can wrap up. The instructions are available, uh, how to uh, use a paper towel and a little bit of water and ship it to us through a courier system. And our uh, lab takes care of all of the expenses of shipping uh, to our lab. And just a follow are you uh, propagating uh, cherry birch also? Yes. Uh, the, we have the technology, and if we are allowed, very good question, I forgot to mention that. The problem is, uh, we, when we had lots of trees, we could not even plant them where they used to exist in nature, the question that was asked. So we talked to city of Hamilton, and um, we were told that, yes, the, uh, the limit of that forest is right here, but you cannot go in and plant it because there are so many so much paperwork that's needed so it has to be planted elsewhere so that's where the story kind of we're still working on it and hopefully someday uh, the regulations will be that's why i said one of the limitations is regulations what you can take in terms of endangered tissue and where you can plant it so those things need to work together um, we have property that has american chestnut on it that uh, we, we would be interested in, in, in you planting trees on. That would be uh, really good. If, we, if the chestnuts are surviving, we actually are looking at the, uh, uh, at the possibility of collecting. Uh, if you let us know, we can make arrangements so that Dr. Shukla and our, our students will, um, will be very, even if you have seeds left uh, and, and we are able to somehow germinate, we can optimize the technology working with the seed grown plants also because they are easier to manipulate in greenhouses the tissue is the smaller and tissue is younger but the principles of micropropagation and cryopreservation will actually be very similar to what we will do with the the older trees so both types of tissues are needed i'm looking for birch uh, uh sorry beech, and we are looking for um, oaks and uh, ashes, uh, ashes are unfortunately dying as well. Um, so either seed or tissues. Uh, we I'm move gonna talk first. Okay. <coughs> yes. If you're looking for um, tissue from certain species, different from like people off their own properties, wherever <laughs> possible. Uh, Parts Canada supplies us what they have, but uh, if we find that is an interesting uh, tree and we can work with, sure, we'll, we'll work. Uh, that's our mandate, so we, we try to find. We will authenticate, of course, because sometimes they are hybrids, like mulberry. It's very hard to get pure red mulberry. Uh, most of them are hybrids. Um, what we need to do is the genetics that we want to save it's a long, lengthy process. If we start with the wrong plant, well. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, what message would you give to uh, like uh, Canada or the world regarding uh, a time limit? You know, because with climate change, they're always saying, oh, it's 2050 or now it's 2030. In your uh, research, what where's the point of, uh oh, we've really got to panic? <laughs> because of... In my opinion, it was yesterday. <laughs> but, but I think whatever we can, uh, what really surprises me is that uh, the, um, we, as I said, it's a very passionate uh, topic, but we don't have a cryobank yet. Uh, I did my earlier education in the University of Saskatchewan, uh, I'm talking about 84. There used to be a small cryo unit, but thanks to the wisdom of some local, uh, I should be sued when they start <laughs> making these statements, but uh, <clears throat> so it was dismantled uh, as if there was no utility for it. So we, um, what we need is a concentrated effort and as of uh, last month it's my uh, my full-time job now to put that program together uh, I, and i'm very grateful to gosling foundation that at least they they gave us a start it was started with american elm but we have a functional lab we have a team of people and now we're training people from mexico cuba 
because this food security uh, research is very important. Countries like Cuba, they have a coffee a variety, which is very popular there, but uh, somehow the seeds are losing viability. They don't give uh, plants anymore or very few numbers of, uh, of plants. So people from Cuba came and they trained uh, in this technology to save what is left, even for breeding purposes. So effort is being made, and I hope that uh, uh, there will be more support uh, coming from uh, all sectors, private and, and government. Yes. I'm just curious, uh, how much ballpark would it cost to um, have a cryobank? Uh, the current cryobank is already in place. What we need is, uh, is the, the research dollars to educate people or train people. Um, so that this technology, if there's one plant, we need one person working on it. So it's easy to have a list. And just to give you an example, for one student, unless I can assure for a PhD student about $35,000 a year for four years, I cannot even accept a student. So that's where the limitation is. There are all kinds of regulations that we have to, to fight against. So who is going to have 35 into four? and then dedicate one species which may or may not work. So I do understand and appreciate um, the, the limitations that many people have. So it takes donors like uh, Gosling. So uh, uh, Susan Gosling, Philip's wife has now uh, assured, she's gonna lead. Um, she was awarded an honorary PhD last year from University of Guelph for her efforts to, to help us. So she and I will join hands and uh, I'm back. Time. Yes. Um, I'm really sorry that you haven't retired yet, but, uh, <laughs> but, I'm, not, but I'm not really sorry. Um, but at least you have a lifetime lifetime supply of Nutella, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, it, it's good. Um, my wife is quite happy. Uh, she says uh, it's peace and quiet while you're working. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Bridget. It was a great okay. talk.